Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And we're really delighted today to be joined by Phil Taubman, who is a uh, important biographer and also a lecturer at Stanford University. Phil has a real interesting background. He grew up in New York City, <clears throat> the Upper West Side, attended Stanford, where he studied history, uh, was editor in chief of the school newspaper, then had a really uh, consequential career in journalism, uh, wrote for Time, Esquire, almost 30 years as a reporter and editor for the New York Times. Uh, he moved to Stanford uh, in 2008 and has had a couple different jobs and is currently the Center for International Security and Cooperation. He's also the author of several really terrific biographies uh, or books, uh, which are, I have two of them on my bookshelf. The first one is called The Partnership, uh, Five Cold Warriors and Their Quest to Ban the Bomb. We'll talk about that for a little bit, but we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about a book that came out earlier this year called In the Nation's Service, The Life and Times of George P. Schultz, which is a wonderful account of a really consequential American uh, statesman and diplomat. Um, one word of kind of personal privilege, uh, when I walk by my conference room every day, I have, uh, we have photographs of distinguished visitors to the Institute, and I oftentimes see the kindly, uh, generous gaze of Phil peering down at me. Uh, he visited the campus in September of 2006 and had a terrific visit here. So um, we hope to get him back in person, but for the time being, we will talk to him uh, virtually, and he's joining us from his home in California. So Phil, how are you doing? Great, thank you. I would uh, love to uh, do a return engagement in person. Great. Well, we will we will work on that for sure. Well, Phil, let's talk a little bit about just uh, you know how you started your career. I mean, you you are at Stanford. You studied history. You were very active in the school paper. Was it relatively clear during your undergraduate days that uh, journalism was the path you wanted to take? It was something uh, I I really set out to do starting in high school, and the reason was pretty simple. My dad was a journalist. Worked at the New York Times also in his case for over 40 years. Uh, and so I got the bug as a kid, you know, watching him work, traveling with him. Uh, it was uh, infectious. Well, you, you had mentioned, um, or I mentioned that you had worked at both Time and Esquire prior to New York Times. I and mean, you were mentioning offline that one of your, I think it was when in Time you were writing uh, about sports, at least partially, and you had a reason to get connected with SIU. Talk about that. Yeah, so I was the sports editor at Time Magazine for three years in the mid-1970s, which was during the period when the New York Knicks were the powerhouse team in the NBA. And they're one of their many stars, but probably their greatest star at the time was Walt Frazier, uh, the point guard from Southern Illinois University. That, yeah, he's uh, he is someone with SIU embraces full uh, full heartedly because he had a terrific. Yeah, time. and I spent I spent a, a week and a half traveling with the Knicks and talking extensively to Frazier. So uh, you know, I I've been familiar with the school going all the way back to that era. <laughs> Great. Well, Phil, let's talk about um, your time at the New York Times. I mean, it's we could spend a whole a whole hour on that, but it was a thirty year career. Very consequential, you know, you're for a time the Washington, D.C. bureau chief, as I understand, you're the Moscow bureau chief. I've, I remember reading your stories back in the day, reread several of them about uh, covering the Reykjavik uh, summit with Gorbachev and, and Reagan. Uh, terrific story about traveling in Afghanistan just a year or so before the Soviet Union left. Um, a wonderful story about the a riveting story about the KGB sort of following you around. And uh, I, think, I think your family had gone to Moscow or to Red Square to take a, a, a Christmas or holiday photo and, you know, you're being ta tailed by KGB agents. So I guess, I mean, we could spend the whole time talking about your career, but as you look back now from the distance of some years, what was most satisfying? What was, what were some of the frustrations? How do you look back on your uh, journalistic career now? Well, you know, I think Moscow was the high point. Uh, you know, I suppose the position of Washington bureau chief is more exalted uh, and maybe more important uh, in the newspaper. But back in the 80s, uh, mid 80s, when I was in Moscow, you know, it was the other superpower capital. Uh, 
uh, and I've, I felt as if I was an eyewitness to history there. As a, as a college student, I read a book uh, <clears throat> by William Shira, uh, a CBS correspondent uh, who was based in Berlin uh, in the late 1930s as uh, uh, Hitler was consolidating power and Europe uh, was on the brink of the Second World War. And Shira wrote a wonderful book, Berlin Diary, chronicling the eyewitness history that he was seeing in Berlin uh, as these uh, epical developments were, were unfolding. And I thought to myself, wow, if I could ever live a life like that, what a thrill it would be. And so fast forward, uh, and there I am in Moscow in the mid 1980s doing exactly that. Uh, it used to give me, you know, uh, uh, an amazing feeling of privilege uh, to to do the work I did in Moscow. I would often say, I can't believe I'm here covering this story for the New York Times. I would pay to be here, and they're paying me to do this. Well, and I, I loved your story uh, on Reykjavik because I remember at the time watching it, and there was this initial sense that, oh my God, you know, this was a a stunning defeat and, a, you know, diplomacy was collapsing and all. But as I read your article, you, you quoted uh, uh, Gorbachev had this hour plus press conference in which, I mean, he was distraught and disappointed, but he kept saying, let's not panic. You know, this is a process. Things will unfold. You know, we have strong relationships where we're discussing important issues. So, it was funny because as I read your article just recently, I, there was you were able to kind of give Gorbachev's more balanced perspective, which was a little bit different than the prevailing wisdom of the time. Yeah, and different from the uh, uh, impression that George Shultz left that same day when he gave a press conference because Reagan, you know, jumped on Air Force One and headed back to Washington after the talks collapsed, and so it was left to Shultz to speak to the world's media. And he was very downcast and and depressed and shaken up, I think, by the by the meetings, which were so dramatic, as, as you know, <clears throat> there was a brief period in Reykjavik at the negotiating table when Reagan and Gorbachev and Schultz and his counterpart, Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Chevernadze, actually talked about eliminating nuclear weapons, period, abolishing them. It obviously didn't happen. But, you know, Gorbachev proved to have a, I think, a better sense of the meaning of the meeting because it was a turning point in the Cold War, even though no agreement came out of it immediately. But it really reset the table for U.S.-Soviet relations in a, in a surprisingly positive way. Well, we'll get back to we'll get to Schultz in a second. But one thing that I, I noted in your book is that um, Schultz, in reflecting upon Reykjavik, I mean, one of the hangups was you know whether to go forward with this strategic defense initiative. So there was a lot of back and forth, but there there was kind of a cri critical dispute about whether a treaty prevented you know uh, um, uh, research. And so there was a word called laboratory that was kind of a, a you know a, a word that kind of blocked. Um, the progress. And years, years later, Schultz was saying, maybe if I had defined laboratory more creatively to include outer space, it might have led to a breakthrough. So I was interesting that years later, he was reflecting on those negotiations and wondering if maybe a creative interpretation of the word laboratory might have yielded a different result. Yeah, you know, that was in response to a question I asked him, <clears throat> uh, because uh, there was this very dramatic moment in Reykjavik where, as I said, they talked about abolishing nuclear weapons. And then uh, Gorbachev said, but, you know, Mr. President, uh, we've got to do something about your strategic defense initiative, this kind of uh, unrealistic idea that Reagan had that we could develop the technology to knock out all incoming Soviet uh, warheads if, if there were to be a Soviet attack on the United States. And Reagan was wedded to the idea. And Gorbachev said, you know, under the anti-ballistic missile treaty, there are prohibitions on the research that can be done on anti-missile systems. So how about we, uh, you know, we talk about a 10-year limitation on what you're going to do and restrict it to the laboratory, quote unquote. Well, it wasn't clear what Gorbachev meant by the laboratory. And what you just alluded to was the fact that Schultz and Reagan <clears throat> failed to say at that point, huh, 
well, can we do something creative with the word laboratory, which will allow us to proceed with research in a way that the Kremlin will accept it and then proceed to abolish nuclear weapons? So it was uh, it was the sticking point that brought the summit to a deadlock. Uh, and it was interesting to see Schultz reflect on that with some regret many years later. Right. Well, Phil, you've mentioned the 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 quest to abolish nuclear weapons, which um, is a hev heavily featured in your book, The Partnership. And your book is a wonderful account of a, imp I mean, Reagan improbably, you know, despite, you know, some of some pretty hard line views on many things, also had this view of a world without nuclear weapons, which many of his advisors would kind of nod, but never really hope that he would forget. Um, but uh, so Reagan had this view and it was largely dormant. But then um, there was a meeting at Stanford in the fall of 2006 that helped revive this idea and, and was kind of forged by a partnership. Let's talk about that for a sec. Tell us about the partnership that that kind of gave new energy to the notion of a world without nuclear weapons. Yeah, it was a really a stunning development uh, in 2006 because you hear you have four men who had been custodians of America's nuclear arsenal during the Cold War. Schultz having been Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger having been Nixon's Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, uh, Bill Perry, uh, who had been uh, uh, a key figure at the Defense Department over the years, ultimately uh, later uh, was himself Defense Secretary, and Sam Nunn, a uh, longtime senator Democrat from Georgia who was uh, chairman uh, of the Senate Armed Services Committee. So it was really Schultz's instigation working with a Stanford physicist and arms control expert named Sidney Drell to bring these men together at Stanford in uh, uh, 2006, which was the 20th anniversary of the Reykjavik summit and talk about the impetus to abolish nuclear weapons and could could new energy be given to that idea? And so they co-authored four of them, uh, absent uh, Drell, uh, they co-authored an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal that was really a stunning piece, surprised everybody. Here are these four men associated with America's defense uh, suddenly coming out and saying nuclear weapons need to be abolished. And it led to a flurry of abolition activity uh, including a, uh, a special Security Council meeting at the United Nations uh, that was chaired at the time by President Obama, and, and the uh, Security Council voted uh, uh, in favor of eliminating nuclear weapons while Schultz and the other men sat there uh, in the Security Council chamber in New York. And Obama went to Prague uh, just a few months after his inauguration in 2009 and gave what it was one of the most ringing speeches ever delivered by an American president uh, calling for nuclear abolition. Unfortunately, the uh, momentum faded over time. And when you look at where we are today, I think the idea sadly has receded back to the sort of uh, periphery of public policy discussion. Well, you, you in your book, you, you write wonderfully. You, you're talking about these, these you know, arch cold warriors uh, pushing this notion of a, a world without nuclear weapons. And you say it was roughly equivalent to John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and Jay Goulding calling for the demise of capitalism. Yeah, the railroad tycoons, uh, you know, it, it was. I mean, it was amazing that these four men did what they did. It's just a shame that the that the steam ran out of that effort after a couple of years. But, but you know, the book, thank you for mentioning the book. The book chronicles their history together through the Cold War, how they overlapped and uh, worked alongside one another in, in different ways. And then the story of how they came together in the pursuit of, of this uh, goal. Well, one of the central figures, maybe the, the central figure in that book is the subject of your bi biography, George Schultz. Um, and um, Schultz is such an interesting person. I mean, in, in the other book, you say Schultz, quote, radiated probity, pragmatism, and republicanism. 
Um, so let's talk about Schultz. He's um, he's someone who grew up in New Jersey, um, you know, served in World War II in the South Pacific, had a you know strong academic background, PhD in industrial relations, and then actually for people in our part of the world. Uh, moved to Chicago, became dean of the University of Chicago's business school. Um, and at one point he said, you know, Chicago was where things started. So tell us, first of all, about, um, you know, how you came to write this book on Schultz, because you knew him from Stanford. And as you started to pursue the book, I mean, one of the formulations you came up with was, you know, I'd, I'd like to do this book, Mr. Secretary. It's your life, but it's going to be my book. So talk about that. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, so my relationship with Schultz dates back to 1983. Uh, I was in the New York Times Washington Bureau covering national security affairs, and uh, I was asked to go on a trip that he was taking to Asia uh, to cover that trip. And then it was extended uh, unexpectedly to the Middle East. So I ended up spending, you know, 10 days, almost two weeks traveling with him and a small contingent of Washington press. So, you know, you get to know a, a Secretary of State when you're on his airplane, you know, circumnavigating the globe. Uh, but, it, you know, it was a, uh, you know, a distant kind of relationship, uh, what you would expect between a reporter and a senior government official. Uh, and then later, uh, uh, I went on a trip with him to South America, and uh, he and I had come to a discussion one day on the first trip about tennis, which we both like to play. So on the second trip, uh, the State Department called me ahead of time and said, bring your tennis racket. And so uh, I unexpectedly found myself on the tennis court with George Schultz and Rio, uh, you know, one day. And, uh, you know, it, it, it brought us into a somewhat more, you know, sort of friendly relationship, but still, you know, a, a proper distance. Then fast forward, I come out to Stanford uh, and uh, I'm working on the partnership book and he pulls me aside one day and said, would you be interested in doing my biography? Surprisingly, there was not yet a biography of Schultz and, and indeed my book is the first. Uh, and so from there on, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with him, but as you say, I made very clear at the outset that uh, I would not do this book if he was insisting on editorial control, uh, because my reputation as an independent journalist is paramount to me, and I wasn't going to sacrifice it in the interest of doing a court biography if that's what he wanted. Well, let's, I mean, Schultz, uh, you know, had this uh, career in academics, and then he kind of, he enters uh, the, the heart of Washington government um, in the Nixon administration, initially as labor secretary, then the White House budget director, and then the treasury secretary. So, you know, in a sh relatively short period of time, you know, he had three really important jobs and developed a reputation as a solid, pragmatic problem solver. I mean, one of the maxims he has that you quote is that, you know, people, when you talk about abstract uh, principles, they oftentimes can't come to an agreement. But if you can direct them towards solving specific problems, you can make progress. So talk about his, his tenure in the, in the Nixon administration. So he came in, uh, and by the way, uh, he was he is one of only two men in American history uh, to occupy four cabinet level jobs. Uh, he came in as Nixon's labor secretary, then served as OMB director, and then treasury secretary. Uh, and I think you would characterize his service in the Nixon administration uh, as a uh, consummate problem solver. Uh, he applied that maxim that you just cited very effectively as labor secretary in a uh, unexpected way, which was to play a leading role in the desegregation of urban school systems in the American South, a job that he got when uh, Spiro Agnew, the vice president, uh, basically said, I don't want to be involved in a task force that he had been appointed to lead by Nixon to deal with desegregation issues in the South. So Schultz ended up running that task force, <clears throat> excuse me, and it was uh, very successful. Uh, he, uh, you know, he helped establish, as I say, the Office of Management and Budget, 
Uh, and then uh, it, as he was involved in some really uh, significant uh, economic uh, policy issues. He opposed Nixon's uh, imposition of wage price controls to try to control inflation, something we're all too familiar with today. Uh, and he was uh, the architect, really, of a fundamental change in the way international currencies are valued, uh, moving it from a dollar and gold fixed uh, basis to the uh, you know open uh, exchange that we all experience today when we travel overseas and we see the value of the dollar is varying from day to day. So you know when you look back on that period, uh, he was uh, very pragmatic, non-ideological, uh, which is really important in understanding what he did as Secretary of State. Yes, he was a very fervent Republican. Uh, but he did not approach the world through the lens of ideology. Uh, he relied a great deal on common sense, uh, <clears throat> and he took a bipartisan approach to trying to solve issues. All of these things are uh, all but uh, you know extinct in Washington today. The one criticism that was made of him as I mean he he, tr he tried to keep, stay as far away from some of the unsavory aspects of the Nixon, Nixon administration. But on a certain at a certain point, he succumbed and, and played, you know, effectively played ball with the White House and and sicking the IRS on a, a leading Democrat. Um, and I mean, he was troubled with it. He didn't like it, but he went along probably further than he should have. And you quote a, a man who I think was the head of the IRS, a gentleman by the name of Johnny Walters, who at the end of it said, in my view, Secretary Schultz like to please the boss. Um, and that's a theme we'll talk about in a second with uh, during his Reagan experience. But but that that would be one area where Schultz has sometimes been criticized is not being willing to walk away from a job to uh, to battle something that he doesn't think is right. Yes, correct. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, you'll the account of this uh, IRS uh, investigation of Larry O'Brien, who was the chair of the Democratic Party at the time, uh, it, my book is the first to really disclose that in any detail. And it's kind of a shocking tale uh, because it uh, conflicts with uh, Schultz's narrative, which was correct, uh, which he liked to talk about, which was when John Dean, uh, the White House counsel under Nixon, came to the IRS chief uh, and gave him a list of uh, people opposed to Nixon, so-called Nixon enemies list, and said, let's get the IRS on these people. Johnny Walters and Schultz said, no, we're not going to do that. They put the enemies list in a safe at the IRS, locked it up, and that was it. But when the White House came back, when uh, this time John Ehrlichman, you know, very senior aide to Nixon, starts pressuring Schultz and Walters to investigate Larry O'Brien, they succumb. Uh, and a very intense, frantic investigation unfolds of O'Brien. Uh, trying to find what they assumed was misconduct in a financial relationship he had after he left the DNC uh, as a consultant to uh, Howard Hughes, the famous reclusive billionaire. They could find no evidence of tax fraud or anything improper, but Ehrlichman kept leaning on them. And so you know, I I lay out that whole story, and you, uh, I'm glad you uh, picked that quote from Walters because it speaks to a trait of Schultz's. I think it was both uh, wanting to please his boss, as Walters said, <clears throat> but I think even more an excess of loyalty to his boss, which you could see with Nixon as Nixon was going down in flames on Watergate, and Schultz, in, in fact, is drawn into a fringe element of Watergate with this investigation, he stays uh, rather than quitting in protest. And and we can come back to this later. Uh, sadly, I think you saw that in a very tragic way at the end of his life, in his loyalty to Elizabeth Holmes, the founder of Theranos, the fraudulent blood testing company, where George supported her, uh, helped her put together a board of directors and stuck by her even as her company was imploding after news coverage of the fraud going on there. Right. 
we'll, we will circle back to that. Well, let's talk about, um, so as Schultz leaves the uh, the Nixon administration just in its final months, he stayed along, around almost to the end. I think he left in May uh, before Nixon's August departure, becomes a, a business executive, a president of, of Bechtel, a big uh, construction company in the San Francisco area, becomes a multinational corporation, becomes a very, very successful uh, CEO. And then, um, and he was, you know, uh, stayed connected to Republican politics, did some advising to Ronald Reagan. And then when Reagan won the presidency, um, he was supposed to offer the job of Secretary of State to Schultz. There was some confusion, thought Schultz wasn't interested, gives the job to Alexander uh, Haig, who imploded after a relatively short period of time. And so Schultz steps in in 1982. So talk, I mean, let's talk about just as he enters, because he knows Reagan, but not, not real well. Maybe a lot of people didn't know Reagan very well. So they had a cordial, respectful, but distant relationship as they entered, as Schultz entered the Reagan administration. So pick it up from there, if you would, Phil. Yeah, no, exactly. <clears throat> and I think it's critical to understand that because uh, his service as Secretary of State and his greatest achievement in public life was uh, unwinding the Cold War, uh, which, of course, he did with Reagan. Uh, but when he got to Washington in 82, he really didn't know Reagan very well and vice versa. Uh, Reagan had invited him out to Sacramento when Schultz came back uh, in 74 to the West Coast. He had had a brief interlude at Stanford on a sabbatical in 68 before he went to work with Nixon. He'd liked the area, so he came back in 74 to work at Bechtel and do some teaching at Stanford. Uh, gov then Governor Reagan invited him to Sacramento to ask him about the federal government and the federal budget. Reagan at that point already, you know, thinking about running for president at some point. And then later, uh, when Reagan was actually running, he invited Schultz uh, to adv provide advice on economic affairs. But they never really talk foreign policy. Uh, and so suddenly Schultz is appointed Secretary of State. And by the way, it's worth noting uh, when we think about the confirmation votes in the United in the divided uh, United States Senate today. In 1982, George Schultz was uh, confirmed as Secretary of State in a vote of 98 to nothing, with two senators missing because they were out of town. You know, when was the last time that happened uh, in Washington? So he becomes Secretary of State, uh, and. He arrives in Washington with this improbable notion of wanting to end the Cold War. Bob Woodward, you know, the reporter of Watergate fame, uh, went to a dinner at Catherine Graham's house not long after Schultz was appointed. She uh, had Schultz over, and uh, Bob sat next to uh, Schultz's wife, Obi. And he turns to her and says, Mrs. Schultz, what is your husband hoping to accomplish as Secretary of State? And she responds without missing a beat, end the Cold War. Bob is stunned to hear this. It's like, are you crazy? Uh, so in, indeed, that's what he wanted to do from the get-go. Uh, and in fact, when you dig into this history, you actually find out that that's what Ronald Reagan wanted to do, too. Although, you know, it was almost invisible at the beginning of his presidency, he was attacking the Soviet Union rhetorically, calling, you know, communism that will end up on the ash heap of history. Soviet Union is, quote unquote, the evil empire. He's pumping billions and billions of dollars into American defense with the assent, by the way, a bipartisan Congress. Uh, but there's very little sign that he's really interested in diminishing tensions with the Soviet Union. So in comes Schultz not really knowing what Reagan wants to do, sets out to try to ease tensions and keeps getting swatted down uh, by the other uh, advisors around Reagan, particularly William Clark, the national security advisor, but also Casper Weinberger, the defense secretary, Bill Casey, the CIA director. So Schultz spends the first really rest of Reagan's first term, remember he comes in 82, uh, in a bureaucratic uh, civil war with uh, aides around the president. Fortunately for me, and I think for history, this civil war was detailed in a diary 
that was kept by Schultz's executive assistant. It is one of the most extraordinary Cold War documents. Ray Seitz, who kept the journal every, every day, kept it in his desk drawer at the State Department. He never told Schultz about it because in his view was, if I tell the secretary, it automatically becomes the property of the State Department. It will be classified top secret and it will disappear into a government vault for decades. He walks, he puts it in his briefcase, walks out of the State Department with it to become ambassador to Great Britain. He gives it to Schultz eventually. It winds up at Stanford University at the Hoover Institution. And I had exclusive access to it in writing the book. And it's it's an astonishing uh, source because Schultz, uh, you know, he'd go into the office after a frustrating day, sit in a chair and lean back and talk. And he's saying, you know, I have no idea what the president is thinking on foreign policy. You know, I can't get in to see him. Uh, you know, this. He's, and then at one point he said, I don't know if it was to Seitz or someone else, he said, talking about the White House, he said, it's the worst organization I've ever seen. It's worse than a university. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are cutting words, Phil. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was really an incredible uh, bloodletting that was going on. The Seitz Diary is just one episode after another where Schultz comes back from White House meetings where he's expecting finally you know, to sit down one-on-one -on -one with the president and he winds up in the Oval Office or the cabinet room or wherever, surrounded by all of these opponents uh, and he can't make any, he cannot, uh, you know, have a one, it's amazing. He says at one point, you know, I, I desperately need to talk to the president of the United States about U.S.-Soviet relations. How can that be, you know, more than a year into his service as Secretary of State that he hasn't had this conversation? But the other thing that you point out is that, you know, this was maybe a little bit later that one of, you know, so Reagan uh, and and really crucially, Nancy Reagan come to like George Schultz, see him as an honest broker, really trust him. And Nancy Reagan and Mike Deaver, an assistant, effectively try to create a channel for Schultz to deal with Reagan uh, directly. And then Schultz is is a little bit reticent because he's afraid that it, you know, it's it's skirting the National Security Advisor and he's kind of breaking, you know, uh, management rules. So he, he did have sort of an entree that at least for a while he resisted uh, taking. That's true. Uh, you know, when you go back and piece this all together, you see that that the, the first real opening for Schultz to get access to the president uh, came courtesy of Nancy Reagan for the reasons uh, that you just alluded to. She was concerned, uh, you know, that her husband was being depicted as a warmonger. And she thought that Schultz was the one person around Reagan who could help uh, create an environment in which Reagan's legacy in history would be as a statesman and a peacemaker, not as a as a riser of tension with the Soviet Union. The other you know, improbable uh, reason that Nancy was able to bring Schultz together with her husband was Mother Nature, uh, which dumped two and a half feet of snow on Washington in February 1983. Nobody could move. People were skiing down Wisconsin Avenue. I was there that day living in Washington. Uh, the Reagans couldn't get up to Camp David, you know, for the weekend where they planned to go. So Nancy invited the uh, Schultzes over to the White House, and they had dinner in the family quarters upstairs. That was the first time that George Schultz really had a chance to talk about East-West relations with the president. You know, but from then forward, uh, you know, it was still a struggle. Schultz was a little reluctant to take advantage of the opening that Nancy and Mike Deaver were giving him. Uh, uh, but eventually over time, especially, you know, after Reagan was reelected uh, in 84, he, Reagan and Schultz finally, finally came to a realization that their impulse about how to deal with the Soviet Union was very similar. Well, Phil, I mean, the other critical element, of course, is the rise of uh, of Mikhail Gorbachev, in which they now has an interlocutor who wants to do business. And as you say, I mean, Schultz had this kind of, you know, he had dealt with Soviet leaders during his previous iterations as, 
uh, you know, cabinet secretary. So he knew that, um, first of all, they needed to be treated respectfully. And then if you also, if you focused on specific problems, you could sometimes make real progress rather than, you know, battling about ideology and communism versus capitalism and so forth. So talk about the the, the critical uh, the critical aspect of the arrival of Gorbachev as an uh, interlocutor who um, the Reagan administration could really work with. Yeah, no, it's, it's essential. Uh, you know, when you look at this history and the end of the Cold War, you realize the imp uh, critical importance of personality in shaping history. You know, I think we all understand there are underlying dynamics that shape history, economic, environmental, uh, sociological, psychological, et cetera. Uh, but when you, when you look at the work that the four men did together in a very short period of time, the four men being Reagan, Gorbachev, Schultz, and Shevardnadze, you see how four men who came to office uninvested in the doctrines of the Cold War, and I think that's a critical point, that none of them were invested in these Cold War doctrines, uh, came in and, and basically said, you know, why are we at the brink of nuclear catastrophe? Let's ease tensions. Let's roll back the confrontation and see if we can work together. And in fact, of course, they did through the course of, of four summit meetings. I think it's important to explain the reason that Schultz thought this was possible was based, you mentioned this yourself a second ago, he had gone to the Soviet Union uh, during the Nixon administration. And, and there are a number of incidents there that I think uh, had a huge impact on his attitude about dealing with the Kremlin. The first was when he went to uh, Leningrad, accompanied by a Stalinist minister, essentially, in the, in the uh, Brezhnev government. Uh, and they're on their way up to Leningrad, and Schultz is saying, we'll go to the Hermitage and see the art. And the minister says, no, the first thing we're going to do is go to the cemetery. So they go to the cemetery, uh, which is the repository of tens of thousands of Leningrad residents and soldiers who died during the 900 day siege of Leningrad during World War II. They're buried in mass graves, not with individual headstones. Schultz is walking down the path between these mounds of mass graves. And suddenly he realizes the translator, the Soviet translator with them has stopped translating. He turns around, she's weeping. Then he sees that the minister, this hard line guy is also weeping. What this says to George is these are human beings too. Yes, they're communists. Yes, they're our adversaries, but they like we mourn for the loss of our countrymen. So that was a really important moment for him. Another one on one of these trips is his wife, who had been a nurse in World War II, goes to a Soviet hospital. She comes back and reports to her husband, you can't believe how primitive Soviet medical care is. It's like a 19th century. And Schultz says to himself, well, wait a minute. This is the other superpower, and they have 19th century medical care. What is that telling us? And then lastly, he negotiated with the Soviet premier at the time, Alexei Kosygin, over Soviet purchases of grain in the United States. And he found Kosygin to be someone reasonable to negotiate with. And when the US signed the agreement for further purchases of Soviet grain, the Soviet Union stuck by its commitments. So he comes into Washington as Secretary of State feeling, you know, Maybe we can actually talk to these people. Maybe we don't have to be in this kind of ideological, frozen, implacable conflict over, as you said, the clash between communism and capitalism. Well, you uh, you quoted in your book um, uh, Gorbachev's uh, commentary on the personalities, and he said something really remarkable. He said, without Reagan, the Cold War would not have ended. But without Schultz, Reagan would not have ended the Cold War. And I want you to pick on that. And also, uh, you know, we don't usually think of George Schultz as a, a man with a sense of kind of um, stagecraft or, or so forth. But there, you, you describe this remarkable moment uh, 
He's at a conference in Helsinki, I think it is. He has not yet met the new foreign minister, Shevardnadze. So he walks to the front of the room, puts down his stuff, sees Shevardnadze on the other side of the room, and he walks over and shakes his hand. And it was this moment of just kind of astonishing graciousness and decency that everyone took notice of. Talk about that. Yes, exactly. So I think to understand Schultz, you have to understand uh, among his many attributes was a, a human touch. Uh, uh, the story that I like to tell that captures that best is when he went into the Oval Office uh, to meet with President Reagan with a colleague at the State Department uh, <clears throat> and named Jim Goodby, who was an arms control negotiator. And all of us who have seen the photographs and video in the Oval Office know that when guests come to meet with the president, the guest, the most senior guest in the room uh, sits in the wingback chair next to the president uh, uh, in front of the fireplace and the other aides sit on sofas on either side of a cocktail table. So Schultz comes into the Oval Office with Jim Goodby and he says, Jim, you go sit there in the wingback chair. I don't know that anybody had ever done that coming into the Oval Office as Secretary of State. Well, you know, Jim Goodby is uh, alive and well in Washington, wonderful man. He's now in his 90s. He has never forgotten that gesture. So when Schultz heard that Shevardnadze had been appointed as Soviet foreign minister, succeeding this incredibly uh, uh, doer figure, Andrei Gromyko, if there was ever a symbol of Soviet intransigence. It was Andrei Gromyko, who, as far as I can tell, never cracked a smile. Uh, and suddenly there's this affable Georgian from the Republic of Georgia, now the nation of Georgia, but in those days, the Soviet Republic is appointed Soviet foreign minister. And Schultz says, I'm going to go to Helsinki to meet him for the first time at an international conference. He says to his wife, Obi, why don't you come with me and let's see if we can establish a rapport with the Shevardnadze's. And so he does this gesture that you recounted, which brought the 28 nations who had gathered delegations in, uh, in uh, Finlandia Hall in Helsinki. It brought the, meet, the discussion in the room to a hush as Schultz climbed the stairs to shake Shevardnadze's hand. And that gesture was the beginning of what turned out to be, I think, probably the most remarkable Cold War relationship uh, between an American and a Soviet official. It, it, over time, became a true and warm and cordial friendship. And it played an absolutely pivotal role uh, in winding down the Cold War. Well, let's try to kind of make an assessment of Schultz. And um, and let me read a couple sentences from your book and have you expand on it. You say, um, deftly solving critical but intractable national and global problems was the leap motif of George Pratt Schultz's life. No one at the highest levels of the U.S. government did it better or with greater consequence in the last half of the 20th century, often against withering resistance. His quietly effective leadership altered the arc of history. And then you go on to say the Schultz model of public service seems almost quaint today, relying as it did on common sense, trust, a human touch, openness to new ideas, and the muting of ideology, partisanship, and histrionics. Expand on that. I mean, that's a wonderful summary of, of Schultz. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, as uh, as I was completing work on the book, uh, you know, it was during the Trump presidency. Uh, and and so the contrast between the Republican Party that Schultz was a be beloved member of uh, and the Republican Party uh, that evolved uh, in the Trump period couldn't have been uh, uh, more striking uh, to me as I was working on the book. So, you know, everything that Schultz stood for, everything that Schultz did in his public life uh, reflected those values that, that, that you just uh, uh, read from the book. Uh, and and it's, it, it, it was so different uh, than the world we live in today. And you know, it's not just Trump. You, you can't blame everything on Trump. 
Trump is in many ways a reflection of a political crisis in the United States. He figured out how to capitalize on, on, on divisions that were developing uh, and did it to a fairly well. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's sad to me to think that someone of George Shultz's competence, quiet competence, uh, uh, just could probably not be very effective in Washington today. Well, let's talk. Uh, I mean, you have a very balanced account and you talk about Schultz's weaknesses. And I want to read a couple sentences and have you reflect on those. You say, yet for all, all his success and competence, Schultz sometimes struggled to command a room, <laughs> pardon me, to get his way to stand up for principles that he con considered paramount. At times, he seemed guileless. These patterns were rooted in a tendency to defer to his bosses, a powerful sense of loyalty, and a belief that manipulative efforts to outmaneuver opponents were destructive to orderly decision making. The dynamics led to a puzzling degree of inaction at critical junctures in his career. Uh, then you talk about the Nixon administration in particular. So talk about that aspect of Schultz, if you would, Phil. Yeah, I think you see it uh, un unfold in, in a variety of uh, moments in his life. The first one we've talked about, which is, uh, you know, using the IRS against uh, Larry O'Brien. He knew better. Uh, 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 Arthur Burns, uh, who was chairman of the Fed during the Nixon administration, uh, kept a journal. <clears throat> by the way, <clears throat> all of these journals that are kept by big, important public figures are uh, invaluable to historians. Uh, I don't think many people have read Arthur Burns' diary, uh, but it had a, a, some very insightful comments about George Shultz and the fact that he observed Shultz knowing that Nixon was corrupt and sticking around rather than leaving. The next moment is when Reagan un unveils the Strategic Defense Initiative in 1983. Schultz knew nothing about it. Again, this is astonishing. The Secretary of State knows nothing about the development of this, um, uh, you know, hugely important new policy the president is considering that will upend uh, the whole doctrine of nuclear deterrence. He learns about it three or four days before the speech is to be given. He tries to persuade Reagan to drop the idea, knowing that it can never be realized uh, in their lifetime technologically. Reagan gives the speech anyway, <clears throat> and Schultz salutes uh, and defends SDI through the rest of his service as secretary, including defending it at the moment when his goal of eliminating nuclear weapons could have been realized. And then lastly, and, and, and most tragically, you have the Theranos uh, case. So I think these were all examples of, uh, in some ways, Schultz either liking the job too much, the liking the, uh, you know, the attributes of power that come when you live uh, as a cabinet member. Uh, but I think even more so a, a, a sense of loyalty which he developed in a in a wonderful way in World War II. You know, if you're in the Marine Corps in combat and your unit is not loyal to one another, that's an invitation to getting killed quickly. Uh, so he came out of World War II believing in the importance of loyalty, but then I think he he misapplied that uh, at times. Well, one relationship that I found really intriguing in your book is Schultz and. Nixon and Kissinger, rough contemporaries, um, but um, and uh, particularly as as Nixon and Kissinger left center stage, they still wanted to be players. Uh, publicly said really nice things about Schultz, but there was a lot of uh, subterranean sniping and and all somewhat deriding Schultz as kind of a plotting you know industrial economist rather than a big strategic thinker and you quoted in your book and this was i think after Reagan was elected but before he made his initial cabinet selections and i think Kissinger was out to lunch with Arthur Schlesinger a friend and liberal democrat but you quote Kissinger saying to Schlesinger George has no knowledge of foreign policy none at all Worse than that, he has no feel for it. In the dozen years I've known him, we have never had a conversation about foreign policy. He just doesn't think in terms of foreign policy. Making him Secretary of State would be like making me Secretary of the Treasury. Talk about uh, Kissinger's kind of passive aggressive, and Nixon too, 
saying nice things about Schultz publicly, but making it clear that they were uh, skeptical of maybe his grand strategic skills. Yeah, well, there's some amazing examples here. Let me start with Nixon. <clears throat> uh, talk about being two-faced. Uh, so uh, he quietly let Reagan know once Reagan was elected uh, that Schultz would not be a good candidate to be Secretary of State. Similar to the comments that Kissinger uh, made that you just uh, recalled with Arthur Schlesinger. Uh, so having undermined Schultz as a candidate for Secretary of State, Nixon then proceeds to write a letter to Schultz after his confirmation hearing in the Senate saying he'd never seen a, a cabinet designee do better at a confirmation hearing. Uh, uh, so, you know, that letter sitting out here at Stanford University and you put it side by side, uh, with Nixon's own memo to his files about telling Reagan that Schultz was not qualified to be Secretary of State. Then later, uh, Nixon seems to hear that words gotten out that he was against Schultz becoming Secretary of State, which of course was absolutely true. So he writes Schultz a letter saying, I've heard these rumors, you know, that I would oppose you as Secretary of State. I've gone back and looked at the record. Nothing could be further from the truth. Oh my God. Uh, you know, okay, so that's Nixon. Kissinger is doing similar things. And then, you know, once Schultz is in as Secretary of State and he and Reagan are easing Cold War tensions, coming to uh, agreements with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, but, uh, Nixon, but particularly Kissinger, Continue, continuously attacks them in public in opinion columns he's writing. So at one point, there's a very testy exchange I found in the files between uh, Schultz and uh, Kissinger about this. So in my inter many interviews with George, you know, I said to him, so tell me, what do you really think of Henry Kissinger? Well, nothing but good things to say. Uh, and in fact, Later in life, they kind of patched up their differences. They worked together on this nuclear disarmament uh, effort, uh, and, and they became really good friends. Uh, I think that Kissinger genuinely valued his friendship with Schultz and vice versa. I think it's a great example of how age softens people uh, and how mutual interest sometimes brings people with adversarial histories together and common purpose. Well, Phil, you're now setting on a task that has some at least two big complexities. You're taking on one of the most uh, complex folks of the uh, Cold War era, Robert McNamara. So you're working on a book with your brother, <laughs> which uh, can be difficult, but I know you and your brother have a great relationship and your brother is a very highly regarded scholar. So tell us a little bit about uh, what the uh, what the what the brothers are doing with uh, George uh, with Robert McNamara. Yeah, so it's funny, Bill, my brother, uh, a professor emeritus at Amherst College, we've kind of operated in the same, uh, uh, you know, kind of sector of history over the course of our careers, Cold War. Bill's written uh, two wonderful books about Soviet leaders, uh, Khrushchev, which won a Pulitzer Prize for biography and a book about uh, Gorbachev. So at, when he finished the Gorbachev book, I said, you know, I've come across a lot of really interesting new material about McNamara. Would you be interested in uh, collaborating on a McNamara book? And he agreed. And now we're two or three years into the collaboration. I'm happy to report it's been a very uh, amiable uh, and productive collaboration. We do have a lot of very interesting new material and, and our hope uh, is uh, not to do another McNamara biography. There have been a number of them. He's been written about extensively, but with the new material and a new round of interviews that we've been doing, we hope we can shed new light on uh, McNamara, do more of a character uh, study and a, and a psychological study of McNamara than a, a conventional biography. Well, how are you slicing up the project? I mean, do you have certain themes that you're working on and he's working on different ones or how does that work? I've never really yeah, seen you know, a book the, with... The way we've divided it up so far is that uh, Bill has been, we have a massive amount of research that we've assembled, thanks largely to fantastic research assistants that I've been able to recruit. Uh, 
you know, recent graduates of Stanford and other schools who have been working full time on this project now for, for three years. Uh, so the way we've divided it up is uh, that Bill is, is dealing with the era up until the time McNamara becomes defense secretary. So his childhood, his time at Harvard Business School, his service in World War II in the, in the Army Air Corps in a unit called STAT Control, which you know, was involved in statistical data about American air operations in World War II, his service at Ford Motor Company. Then he becomes defense secretary under JFK, serves through the uh, Kennedy and Johnson administrations until 68. I'm dealing with the Defense Department years and the Vietnam War, which, which you know, is why most Americans think of McNamara and many Americans uh, disdain him for his management and prosecution of the war. And then Bill is picking up the narrative at the World Bank after the war and the last decades. Interesting, interesting. Well, Phil, let me ask you uh, this question. I mean, you've you've had this terrific career as a journalist. You're this terrific career as biographer. What are the kind of competing uh, attractions of the two in terms of, is it maybe even a phase of life that maybe in your younger days, I mean, being a reporter was, you know, was, was stimulating and then, you know, you make a transition to book writing or, or tell me how that has played out for you. Well, you know, I, I would value them both equally. Uh, you know, I spent 40 years uh, in daily or weekly journalism. Uh, it has an adrenaline rush, uh, the likes of which you don't get in most other professions. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to travel to places that you would never go otherwise. I, I counted up one day. Uh, I've visited over 80 countries in my journalism career. Uh, I've lived in the Soviet Union in my journalism career. Uh, so, you know, it was a tremendous uh, opportunity and privilege. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I was also attracted to book writing, which gives you a chance to dig deep into things deeper than you can typically as a journalist. Uh, and, and, and so that has been very satisfying to me, too. Uh, and, and it's been able to, for me, marry my interest in the Cold War and my involvement in the Cold War as someone who had a ringside seat during the Cold War uh, to allow me now to go back and re-examine the Cold War uh, in a more scholarly uh, endeavor uh, and to have access to documents like the Sites Journal, which tell me things that happened during the time, for example, I was covering George Shultz that I had very little idea about at the time. So they've been both mutually, I would say, equally satisfying. I feel extraordinarily fortunate to have had this kind of double career. Well, finally, Phil, for the students who might be watching, what would you, um, what kind of advice would you give about what you've learned? I mean, just broadly about professional careers and maybe journalism in particular, but even more broadly. I mean, what would what would be the sort of advice you might give to your twenty year old self about launching a career? Well, you know, I think uh, the world of journalism has changed, obviously, uh, especially in the last decade or two. There are many more jobs available now in digital journalism uh, that didn't exist, of course, back in my era. Some of the mainstream journalism jobs have uh, have been cut back. Uh, but the profession, in many ways, uh, is still doing what it's always done, trying to uh, you know, hold people accountable, speak truth to power, which is a powerful motivation to get into journalism. Uh, but I would I would say to people, as I do at Stanford, where I've taught and, and uh, advised students over the years, uh, you've got to lay the groundwork for a career. You can't just blow out of college as an undergraduate and expect to succeed in journalism uh, if you don't have the grounding in some field. In my case, it happened to be history. Uh, these days, it actually might be computer science. Uh, it might be in digital graphics. Uh, it might be in uh, data uh, analysis. There are many new technologies applied to journalism. 
But if you really want to get launched into journalism today, you need to uh, offer employers some level of expertise as you come out of college uh, or graduate school, if you have the opportunity to go to college and graduate school, because that's what employers are looking for. I think when you look at the hundreds and hundreds of new employees hired by the New York Times uh, in the decade and more since I retired, uh, many of them uh, don't have conventional journalism backgrounds. They come out of the world of uh, technology and they're applying technology to journalism. The best and the most inspiring example I can give you is the forensic video journalism the New York Times has done in Ukraine. Uh, you know, where they went into the Ukrainian city where the S Russian forces had committed atrocities. They assembled a vast amount of video information and they put it together. I, I urge people to go look at that report that will basically someday be the basis for uh, international uh, criminal justice prosecution of Russian troops uh, in Ukraine. It's an amazing piece of journalism, and it's a journalism that didn't exist, couldn't be done 25 years ago. Right. Very interesting. Well, Phil, thank you for such a terrific conversation. It's been really interesting. And I would say to our viewers, I, I would commend Phil's uh, going back and looking at some of his journalism. He has a tremendous website, so you can you can see some of his journalism. Both of it, the books that I've been brandishing are really terrific and interesting and and consequential. So, Phil, thank you so much for a great conversation. We will find a way to coax you back to Southern Illinois and uh, and uh, have you come back here so we can get yet another photo to put of uh, of you on our wall. So, thank you so much. Yeah, great. I look forward to it. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series. We'll have a video of this conversation on our website in the coming days. Please look at it, show it to family and friends. Thanks for following us. Uh, watch us on social media. And thank you for helping us keep the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.